I'm Kevin Casey. I'm a professional mixed martial arts fighter. And right now, what I'm about to do is issue a warning out to all other competitors. I like my money. I'm I'm kind of pro gun. I don't want overs. I just expect them to happen. Fatty's gonna fatty is real. He is terrible. I'm gonna go quick because I don't give a fuck about anything that's gonna happen on Saturday. Welcome to this week's edition of the MMA Analysis Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Tastruck, and joining me, as always, for another thrilling female headlined card, <laughs> Jay Primetown. Jay, I, are you just so psyched for the debut of the women's featherweight division? With bantamweight fighters? Yeah, with fighters who, who couldn't compete at bantamweight anymore. So they were like, you know what? You know what we need to do? Move up in weight. That's what's been holding <laughs> us back. Uh, yeah, they, they, that seems to be a great strategy. Uh, you know, that way you can have well-known, established fighters uh, jumping, you know, st- going into a new weight class. And you could really promote it and sell a lot of pay-per-views, Brad. Yeah, and then the 135-pound champion can stop defending that belt and just move up to 145. Right. And you can um, have another double champion. Oh, Ooh. yeah. That's going to do a million pay-per-view buys because we, you know, we, we know all title for title fights generate a million pay-per-views. And um, all female fighters are stars. So Yes, yes. Yeah, those are, those are the rules. That's how it works. Yes. Also joining me today, new Sean. How's it going up in uh, Are you up in the Arctic again? Oh, no, I'm not in the Arctic, but it feels like the fucking Arctic. It was like minus 30 today. Mm. So that's good. Oh, yeah. so Fahrenheit or Celsius? <laughs> it doesn't matter. At that point, it's the same. It's fucking cold. <laughs> <Wow>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, four of the last six events have been headlined by females. I know. It's well, the next, the, pretty yeah, awful. I think this is the end of that streak, though. Thank God. <laughs> this ain't like... If you're the type of person that's out there getting excited about this fight, you really need to reevaluate your priorities. I mean, if it was Andrade versus Joanna, that would be different. Yeah, that's a good fight. Is the UFC going to learn from this when it, this comes in at like 125,000 buys? I hope it does under 100,000 buys. I hope. I'm guessing. It's not going to because it's got Anderson on it, but... I, I really want this to just absolutely tank like nothing before. It's not. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not going to be the tank job you're you're hoping. Yeah, for. I they didn't know. They didn't add Anderson. It it would be one of the lowest ever. <laughs> it would yeah. have to be. It would be sub Mighty Mouse stuff. And Brooklyn deserves better. You guys heard the twang. We got Wes Wes Colvin on with us tonight as well. Wes, how we doing? Doing great, man. Um, Silver. Finishing up watching uh, my cats. Sober. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sober tonight. Um, <laughs> pretty, not completely, but no alcohol, no alcohol tonight. I had, I had enough Saturday watching. I don't know. I guess that card did pretty well. It was a pretty decent card. We'll talk about it, but got a yep. over over a million views and stuff. So yeah, not bad. Here you go. It's almost like this uh, promotion with Fox and football actually works. Yeah, cool. go figure. If you advertise on a platform mm-hmm. where people are actually watching something, they'll tune in to watch your thing. Crazy yeah. how that works. Before we get into the UFC card, though, a little bit of free agency news in our first word. Ryan Bader's headed to Bellator. We've got uh, another light heavyweight, Misha Serkinov. Uh, former light heavyweight, Lorenz Larkin, testing free agency. And then... More light heavyweight, David Branch. Well, although he's, you know, he's, he's every weight. He's the champion of every division <laughs> that's ever existed. <laughs> Him and Marlon Marais, uh, they're, I guess, World Series is sort of done. If you've seen some of the like legal documents that have been filed lately, uh, but regardless, him and Marlon Marais are both <laughs> agents from there. So we've got a whole bunch of people uh, testing free agency right now. Where do we think everybody's going to end up, and you know, what do you think about the sort of new era in MMA free agency, Jay? Before we get to that, did anyone else hear like see Branch's tweets about how he was like threatened by World Series of Fighting, and then he went on Helwani's show and 
literally wouldn't talk about it. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, why'd you go on the show then if you weren't going to talk about it? Or why I don't know what that too. Yeah, why? Uh, it's very, the lawyers. The lawyers probably called. Yeah, you know, he's. <laughs> it's a pretty aggressive. Up. But it's my yeah. point. Is, it's a pretty aggressive comment to kind of make. Well, they threatened me. Like, what, what does that even mean? Like, what are they threatening you? It doesn't really make any sense. Very, very, very weird. But uh, I mean, the, the free agent thing, free agency thing, is pretty cool that we're kind of seeing it and having a bunch of fighters kind of. Uh, you know, coming around at the same time and having the opportunity to go to different places. I, I think having fighters move around to different promotions is a positive thing. I mean, first of all, it makes for more fresh matchups, which is always, you know, what we always want. We, You know, when divisions get stale, like the light heavyweight division in the UFC, like there's problems because, you know, if you don't have anyone moving around and no there's one... There's a difference needs- between stale and just completely rotten. Yeah, it's and definitely shit. the rot side. It's the worst division in the UFC by it's of the male divisions. Let's say <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> you, you mean it's I worse know. than the division that uh, is debuting this weekend, which has two fighters and one suspended fighter? <laughs> Doesn't count. Um but yeah. But I I know if Lance was here he'd be arguing for all fighters under one umbrella because he wants to see the best guys fight each other, blah blah blah. I get what he's going for, but I think separating some guys so that they don't really face each other or don't have the opportunity to face each other is good too because it allows you to think like, ooh, what could happen? And then, you know, when you actually have the free agency, you know, then you wait a couple of years and you actually get to see that fight. I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, like, for example, if Michael Chandler was already in the UFC, like you'd already, you wouldn't have that kind of allure. But now that he's in Bellator, you kind of have, you know, you kind of just have to dream it up how it would go. And maybe in a year or two, he ends up in the UFC himself, and then you can start doing some of the matchups. It, it allows to, you know, to be able to build up like a fighter that way, especially from an outside org. Like even a Justin Gates is another good example. Like how good is he really? But you know, people talk him up like he's the greatest thing since sliced bread because he hasn't faced those other guys yet. So I just think it a lot. It's it's kind of a way that fighters can build themselves up too. So yeah, it's kind of crazy because it used to happen all the time with you know guys uh, building themselves up in Japan and then coming over to the U.S., but then they all tanked in the U.S., so people kind of lost that mystique. Um, But, yeah, you've sort of seen it with, like, Eddie Alvarez, Hector Lombard, uh, those sorts of guys, and obviously mixed results. But the the one time where, you know, that sort of transfer of talent really happened and it didn't get a whole lot of hype was, you know, WEC – lightweight division coming over to the UFC and then dominating the UFC for the next, you know, three, four, five years, which was kind of crazy. So, yeah, it, it is possible to to build up that hype and have guys come into the UFC successfully. And, yeah, it's uh, hopefully going to lead to fighters making more money and, and all that fun stuff that people like to, to bitch about all the time. But, you know, as to, to Lance's stance on this whole thing, everybody should be under one umbrella. I'm just going to say, that sounds a lot like communism. That sounds Lance. like communism, <laughs> and that's, that's weird coming from Mr. Capitalism over there. <laughs> Mr. America. Mr. Yeah. Uh, Sean, what are your thoughts on uh, free agency? Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a good thing for the fighters. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess we don't really know too much if it is a good thing for fighters. I mean... Some guys that have gone on to Bellator, they don't really, I mean, are they making more money? We don't really know. I mean, they keep saying that they treat them better, but what does that even mean? Um, I mean, it sucks that Bader's leaving because he is like a a top five guy. Didn't Um, Rory McDonald sign with Bellator like three years ago and he still hasn't fought? It's coming. It's coming. (laughs) Yeah. But But uh, he's he's getting that sponsorship money, though. Sponsors. (laughs) I don't. Huge. I honestly don't know if there's really much money in sponsorships anymore. Like after after the Reebok thing, I I think Reebok just killed sponsorship even outside the UFC. Like people are just like, there's just no money in this. There was no sense in putting putting anything out there. Like it. I just I mean personally, I just don't think there's that many companies willing to spend money um, in the sponsorship space. Like yeah, in they just math, don't think there's massive much of a return. Yeah. I think I think they're doing it, just not maybe not the money they're spending because every guy on a Spike Bellator card is shirts and shorts Dynamic are full. Fastener. I mean, condom when, you, 
when you can get a million and a half viewers on a Friday night and it's all 18 to 35 year olds, that's some pretty good advertising. I yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. Um, I just don't think the money is as much as it it's was. Not what it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in that not realm. Not in that realm, at least. But when you're getting, when you're getting a $3,000 Reebok check or you can get a $15,000 Yes. You know, collective of checks from the seven sponsors you got for a thousand here, a thousand. You know, uh, yeah. it's got to be a, it's got to be a little better, I would imagine. I mean, I think yeah. that the, the Reebok deal kind of fucked over Bellator fighters too, because the all the sponsors that now are going to Bellator, they're like, well, we're not going to pay you that much because I mean, it's not like we're going to yeah, we don't you have no choice. Like, it's yeah, like what's your other <laughs> option? Yeah, yeah. like. But, uh, I mean, I do expect Branch and Marais and Sarkinov to, to sign with the UFC. Um, just with how long Larkin's been out, I would have to assume that he's going to go with Bellator. It's just been way too long for him to be yeah, gone. And he's got UFC. those previous ties with Coker. Yeah. So. so, I don't know. It should be interesting to see uh, how Branch and Marais stack up. I mean, Branch has been there before, but he's definitely grown as a, as a fighter. And Marais, everybody's kind of always talked, but he's been fighting kind of unknown guys so another another guy in the the bantamweight division right all you hear yeah. about is these ridiculous world series of fighting contracts though that branch was on like a 60 and 60 yeah, yeah i mean i mean it's a lot of money for i mean i guess he was like pretty you know he was, was their a, champion, he's a but dual champ i mean he should probably get that but i guess in the scheme of you know how what guys are paid currently like 60 and 60 is pretty decent is like I don't know I don't know I don't I don't have the numbers in front of me but it seems like something like like a Travis Brown would be paid. Who yeah, I, I for mean, lack of a better term, is a lot more well known than Dave Branch. Would you ever want to like leave somewhere when you're making that kind of money? And then you see guys like at your level making twenty and twenty and shit. I mean, mm-hmm. guys like Asker yeah. and fighting in Japan for one hundred and fifty k. You know, like I'd say fuck the UFC. You know, and you got to fight killers in the UFC for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, part of it. Um, I guess. You know, if he really believes he could compete with some of these top these top dogs, I mean, I, there's always going to be that aspect that you just want to compete against the true elite fighters and see how good you really are. And maybe that's worth it to some extent, but I mean, like <laughs> not that worth like, it. <laughs> like, like someone like Sam Alvey, like who gives a shit if he's in the UFC? He's all about just you know fun fights and making money. Like yeah, he, he could fight, shit. like he, he fight shit. anywhere. But yeah, if he was knocking out cans every month in World Series of Fighting and getting paid the same money, should he be doing that? Yep. Yep. But a lot of guys don't have that mindset. Uh, Before we move on, Wes, any thoughts on uh, you know Ryan Bader versus Phil Davis two through seven that are going to happen <laughs> in the Bellator light heavyweight division, or uh, any other free agency thoughts? Well, on um, on Branch, since we was talking to him, I'm, if he doesn't take like a real drastic pay cut, um, I think he's he's probably going to end up in Bellator because. I just can't imagine the UFC wants a guy like that that's pretty good that's going to come over and, and hunt their their top ten guys for fifteen minutes and <laughs> and just be he's he's good at what he does but he's he's not like a terribly exciting fighter or anything but um, yeah I kind of think back to WC like you did kind of them guys coming over and then even when the UFC bought Strike Force it's like you know fr- fresh guys can can liven up weight classes and. Um, guys like Sarkinoff, though, like you, you can't let guys like that walk out of the UFC. Like I kind of see what what Lance says a little bit. Like you do want the best guys fighting each other in the UFC, um, but I, I have no problem with like the the Baders of the world and your Larkins and stuff. Like those guys made it up that ladder and just couldn't get over the hump. You know, go make the the best money you can. You got to think this is going to help fighters in general if there's other options they they can negotiate with but um i don't see how it it really helps the ufc i think the ufc is just going a different way now um i just don't think they're gonna give guys that ain't pulling in pay-per-view numbers big contracts anymore um they'd rather sign new guys well just yeah that just fresh guys and and they have their stars that they make their money off of and, and that's it everybody else is is expendable now um, you, you let a guy like Bader go who's a known name that doesn't make a whole lot of money and is a top five guy. If you're going to let a guy like that walk, you're, you're going to let almost anybody walk. But 
hopefully they can go make some more money. Uh, I'm all for Bellator putting on some better fights because I watch Bellator on Friday nights. Uh, the more guys they can get in there, the better. But I think Brad's right. You're, you're going to see, uh, Bader and Phil Davis probably fight three or four times and, uh, Rory's going to fight somebody through. They just, they don't have enough, enough of those names yet, but, Hopefully they get more, man. Hopefully guys make more money. I think that's what it's all about. I'm, I'm pro fighter. Um, you know, the UFC and these guys make all the money they could imagine. Um, I'm all for fighters making, making more money and as much as they can. All right. Moving on to UFC 10, fight night 104. Quick recap here. We're going to kick it off with the prelims. Uh, we had six preliminary fights starting on fight pass. Light heavyweight division, Khalil Roundtree defeats Daniel Jolly. 52 seconds, uh, a pair of pretty nice knees to finish that one off from the clinch. Welterweight division, Nico Price defeats Alex Morono. Nice. KO right before the buzzer, or the horn, in the second round. It's actually <laughs> five minutes was the time of the KO in that one. Moving up to Fox Sports 1. Tisha Torres defeats Beck Rollins, 30-27 across the board. Bantamweight division, Ricardo Hamos defeats Michinori Tanaka. Not Michinori Tanaka, apparently. <laughs> Unanimous decision, 29-28 twice, and an awful 30-27 scorecard. Oh, Featherweight geez. division, Chaz Skelly defeats Chris Grutzenmacher by submission. Two minutes and one second of the second round. And... Curtis Blades just tosses Adam Milstead around like a rag doll. Milstead butts, busts up his knee in the first round, and then his corner's like, you know what? You're fighting a dude that's <laughs> tossing you around on one leg? Go do it some more. And then his knee completely exploded 59 seconds into the second round. Jay, thoughts on the prelims? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess we'll just kind of start and end with, with Curtis Blades, uh, that that kind of reminded me of when Habib ragdolled Abel Trujillo, except for the you know the knee tear or whatever ultimately happened to Milstead. Um, it was completely dominant grappling, just just physical a dude, and really the guy had no chance in that bout. Um, it was one sided. It was a smart um, game plan from Blades, and uh, based on his physical size, and if he can really keep up that pace like he claims he can. Uh, heavyweight has two legitimate prospects now, which is really cool to see. And it's heavyweight starting to become, uh, you know, a pretty hop in division of the UFC. Um, you know, we kind of all called it dead like two or three years ago. Um, but here we are. Um, you have Stipe Miocic is champion, who's, you know, relatively young. JDS is still around. Um, and you have these two kind of up and comers. I mean, you have Derek Lewis as well, who I don't think is as good as these two guys, but, um, you know, you have some new blood there, um, and it's 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 nice to see. Sean, thoughts on the prelims? Torres and Skelly as uh, as mid minus two hundred favorites is is baffling in in hindsight. They just <laughs> absolutely dumb. Those are the two that I had parlayed together. Yeah, smart smart man right there. Uh, I was dumb and and took the uh, the over one and a half in the Skelly fight. I thought uh, Grutzmacher could just hang on for a little bit, but. Chaz Skelly, when he gets you gets you on your back, you're you're in big trouble. Um, and then yeah, that blades was blades was impressive, just tossing a, a big man like that all over the place. And and I don't know what the hell that guy's corner was doing. I don't know if they were just looking to get a, a handicap parking uh, sticker or, or what the <laughs> hell they were doing there. But that was a, it was a bad idea. If, if his knee is that fucked, just just throw in the towel, man. Fight another day. Yeah, he probably could have fought. You know, well, not fought, but he probably could have been recovered in like, you know, four six weeks if it was a sprained knee, which is kind of what it looked like in the first round. And now it's going to be you probably, <laughs> yeah, got, anywhere got works from on uh, nine to eighteen months, depending on, uh, on what the actual damage fought. was. And yeah. that's not work. And that's not workers' comp. I don't think either. <laughs> no. Job. No, 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 not with his day job. Now, the pipeline company ain't paying for him getting his fucking knee tore up in a fight. No, you know? so that's bad. Sorry, Adam. And I didn't even hit the fatty. He's going to fatty on that one because of his knee. Damn it. <laughs> no, Wes, that. prelim thoughts? Uh, yeah, Curtis Blades, man. Uh, I even, I thought, I thought 
when I watched him the first time against uh, Hagano, um, <laughs> that those two were probably going to meet each other again in the future. Uh, yeah, I was impressive by Blaze, man. I, I think those are two, like Jay said, uh, two really good prospects in, in the heavyweight division. Um, Skelly, man, I, I think that dude, um, his skills are starting to catch up with it, with his intangibles, his, his fight IQ and his toughness. Uh, that guy's looking pretty good. I, I think he could be a tough <laughs> out for a lot of guys. Um, and then, yeah, man, uh, the first fight, man, Cleo Roundtree, I, I, that's what I expected out of that guy coming off of, of tough. Um, he just had worried me. He got took down like really easy in, in his debut and, and just kind of got mashed, but take down defense look there. And man, those were some beautiful knees. The, the guy said he's taking this as a job now and he, and he's, he's training full time every day. So, uh, kind of, you know, curious to see where, what, what he can do going forward as well. Yeah, for me, you know, Blade's obviously impressive. Um, as Sean said, I like those prices on uh, Skelly and Torres. You know, I I kind of said earlier this year that I was going to scale back betting on women's fights, but I ended up having two units on Torres in a parlay and five on her, uh, the points handicap in that one. So, so much for that. Um, but yeah, impressive performances by by a couple people on the prelims. Um, yeah, but moving up to the main card, also on Fox Sports 1, women's strawweight division, Jessica Andrade defeats Angela Hill, 30-27 across the board. Little Marcel Fortuna defeats Ugh. Big Anthony Hamilton, 3 minutes and 10 seconds of the first round. Just putting Anthony Hamilton in some sort of like zero gravity chamber stumbling all over the place uh that was kind of interesting light heavyweight division Volkan Ozdemir Spock defeats Ovin St. Pru split decision 29-28 28-29 29 lightweight division James Vick gets robbed of the performance of the night bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely robbed. Oh. Defeats Evil Trujillo. Forty nine. If you ask one more time. <laughs> Forty nine <laughs> seconds of the third round on the seventeenth Darce choke attempt that he made in that fight. Women's strawweight division. Felice Herrig defeats Alexa Grasso. Unanimous decision. Twenty nine twenty eight times two and a thirty twenty seven. And for some reason, that was the co-main event as opposed to the actual good straw weights that were on the card earlier. And the main event, Chen Sung Jung defeats Dennis Bermudez, coming back from a three-and-a-half-year layoff or whatever, and just landing that Korean zombie uppercut, two minutes, 49 seconds of the first round. Bye-bye, Bermudez. Jay, thoughts here? For as good as the undercard was... The main card was like the complete opposite um, in pretty much every facet. I think I was up like almost five units on the undercard and then Anthony Hamilton. I mean, the first fight was was great to watch. It was one of the better women's fights um, you'll ever see. I mean, you have the female John Lineker, which is exactly what Jessica Andrade is at this point. Everything she does, her style of punching, the way she approaches um, her striking, it's very similar to Lineker. A lot of fun to watch, really fun fight. And then it just got weird with Anthony Hamilton being knocked out by a man who's never knocked out anyone before and a guy who probably was, you know, outweighed by 50, at least 50 pounds in the cage. Just kind of stunning. Um, I have to be honest. I was really, uh, I wasn't expecting that one at all. Um, and then it got even more weird with, with Osp losing a split decision to a guy that, you know what? I thought he was in that fight in all seriousness. Um, and really, he should have finished them late in the third, but Osp didn't really go for it because he's Osp. Um, so it is what it is. And then James Vick has no leg to stand on. He, he 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 had to try that submission at least four times before he got it. I mean, it's embarrassing thinking he deserves a bonus compared to these other people who you know land a clean shot and KO somebody, and he can't even put together a simple choke over a guy who doesn't know how to defend one. His arms are too long, Jay. Oh yeah, my arms are too long. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's like that's like Tito complaining his hog is too small. It's, you know, it's too big. Give me a break. It's too big. Ladies don't want to talk. Uh, Sean, thoughts here? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I know we shit on on women's fights a lot, but that uh, that opener between Andrade and Angela Hill was was awesome. Uh, and then they made up for it in the co-main event, which exactly. was equally as horrible. <laughs> That's true. You just We just can't have nice things. That's just the way it goes. All right, well, uh, yeah, Anthony Hamilton should retire. If you, if you lose to a middleweight, get knocked out by a middleweight and, you know, climb an imaginary wall or, you know, do what he did, he he should just retire. He's, he's bad enough as it is, and then get knocked out by a middleweight is terrible. Uh, OSB is a is a drunk fighter. That's what that's what he looks like when he fights. It's weird to watch. <laughs> uh, that Vic Trujillo fight was terrible. Like the first round was absolutely garbage, and then he's complaining about a performance of the night bonus. Like, come on, bud. Uh, Harry Grasso, that was the easiest over two and a half I think I've ever bet, which was awesome. And then. Korean Zombie did Korean Zombie things. Looks not very good, even though Dana White said that's one of the best uh, comebacks he's ever, like, guy being out for so long and then looking so good. Like, he got lit up a lot by Bermudez, and then he landed a punch because Bermudez doesn't have a chin. But it's always fun watching Korean Zombie fight, so that's good. Yeah. I, I know that I've mentioned it a couple times already, but Herrig Grasso was really bad. Like it was, it was a really bad fight, guys. We were live talking about the fights, <laughs> and I was falling asleep watching this fight, even though I was talking to you guys at the same time. Like I, I honestly don't remember anything that happened in the fight because I, I think I immediately blocked it from my memory. Wes, thoughts on the main card? Yeah, that that one took like the steam out of everything. Like it was like everybody was talking, having fun, and then nah. um, <laughs> yeah, the the Andrade Hill fight. I thought it was a really good fight, but it's like people. Were, I seen some people saying like you know Hill was it was a great fight, kind of between them. It, it was, and it was Hill was really tough and took a hell of a beating. So it kind of made it as as good as it kind of seemed. Uh, still a really good fight though. She stayed in there really tough. Uh, and I, I would hope that they give her another, another fight, a little bit of easier fight, uh, cause I think she's really improved since, uh, since she came back from Invicta. And then, yeah, I think Andrade and, and, and JJ is a pretty interesting fight. Um, I'm really looking forward to see it. And I think Jay's absolutely right. It's like the female version of, of Lineker, man. It's almost the same exact look, style, at just everything. Um, yeah, fuck Anthony Hamilton. That dude cost me so much money. Uh, he should go fight and I don't know, Siberia or some shit. Uh, OSP, man. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many times I'm going to keep letting this dude just cost me money, but I, I don't even know if this guy should fight anymore. Like, like Sean said, he looks drunk. Like he just doesn't care. I don't think he's ever lifted his hands over his waist. Like ever. <laughs> I, I don't think it's happened one time in his life. Um, yeah, James, James Vick, man, shut the fuck up. Learn how to do a choke properly and then you can ask beg for bonuses. And what do y'all think about that? Do y'all think that looks bad? Like some people say, well, they need to like speak up and, and ask for shit because they get paid so bad. But don't don't you think Dan is like if you're begging for it, I'm not giving you shit. You know. I mean, I don't mind like the right after the fight. Like that was yeah. an awesome finish. Crowd like cheer for me. Get if me you knock somebody out or something or get yeah, some kind get of finish. nice, yeah. But to go on at onto like social media like a day later and say you know you know I keep retweeting or just commenting like that you deserve a bonus. It's like. Like, dude, go back and look at the other things and see what you lost to. I don't think anyone thinks that, like, you know, if they're gonna if they're gonna hold to this four, you know, this four bonus a night thing with two of them going to a fight of the night and then two going to a finish, I, no one thinks you had one of the top two finishes of the night. Sorry, that's the reality. It's not like you were robbed or someone's like stealing, you know, stealing it from you. And there's no there's no case to be made here. There isn't. I mean, Roundtree has a much better case than you do. Yeah, I was going to say, if there were four, like, if the four bonuses were all four, like, the best finishes of the Knights, I don't even think he gets one. Yeah, Roundtree would get one, and then, uh... Zombie would get one. Yeah, they already uh, gave out to, to Fortuna. Yeah, Fortuna gets one, Roundtree gets one, but and things. I would and think probably, probably Chaz Kelly. Or, yeah, or Nico Price, Kelly. yeah. Yeah. Blades, too, right? 
I wouldn't give one to Blades just because it was injury, but you know, it was I'd, awesome. I'd still I'd still give it to him over Vic. I mean, Vic literally. Oh yeah, it's just a bad look, right? I mean, yeah, pre- yeah. You're I, begging for it so. way after the fact. It's you're not going to get the bonus, so why are you even doing but that? But even that, new Sean, it's not like he it's not like he was deserving of it. That it wasn't well. a special finish. So like yes. you have no leg to stand on. It's not like you landed something crazy and then you didn't get it. I mean, th- there's no leg to stand on. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. it looks stupid. Just because you want to get paid more doesn't mean you get paid more. That's the reality. Yep. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good with a guy doing it like you knock somebody slick out or get some nice choke. I, I'm fine with it after a like, fight. But didn't Price do it in his post fight interview? Uh, I thought he said yeah. something about like a bonus in his post fight interview. Which, as much, so. Yeah, and like hype no. up the crowd doing it. Don't just beg. Be he, like, do you he, just talk to the crowd and be like, do you like that finish or something like that? Don't don't do what that guy did. Like, yeah, I'm even fine with the Conor McGregor style if you, like, knock a guy out like Price did and, and make him look like a zombie laying against the cage, you know. Like, that's that's cool with me. Like, 50 Gs, baby. Give me some money, Dana. You know, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're just yeah. doing it that one time and then it's over, you know. That's yeah. part of the that's part of the thing. To yeah. do it days – to do it the next day on Twitter is just like – no, that you can't do that at all. It's after the fact. That just looks really terrible. Um, yeah, and then uh, last two fights. Uh, slow the hype on on Grasso. Like she was the next big thing, man. And but terrible fight. Brad's right, falling asleep. Um, hell and uppercut by by zombie man. That that was awesome. I think I woke us all back up. Um, but Sean's right. Bermuda has tagged him up a few times. He he was stunned a couple times. Um, so I, I don't know if that was uh, ring rust or, or what. I'm sure it's a little of that, but um, he's always in wild fights, man. Uh, guys with some power can could catch him, but yeah, great fight and uh, awesome finish. All right, with that, we are going to move on to this weekend's card: UFC 208 from the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. Kicking it off. With three UFC Fight Pass prelims. First in the featherweight division, we have the next Anderson Silva <laughs> against Rick Glenn. Jay? I got both these guys at D+. Plus. Um, I was kind of surprised to see Glenn as, a, as high a favorite as he is. Um, but that said, I do think he, he probably wins this fight. He, he, he kind of throws the kitchen sink at, it, at opponents, and that generally leads to victories, especially kind of lower rungs of um, the UFC, um, you know, Nover's a guy, obviously who never m- met expectations is, is, you know, he's, he's kind of crafty though. Um, and he is a veteran. So, you know, this one should go to the scorecards. I'd be pretty surprised if there's a finish. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, it's weird. It goes to a decision, you know, you get a weird result, like things happen. So like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if Nova wins either. Nova's the local New York nurse. There you go. Yeah, Sean, Philippe Nover is is terrible. Um, he is, but <laughs> yeah, but there's if Rick Glenn isn't good enough for me to bet him either. Um, I'll pick Rick Glenn, but yeah, this is this is not anything that excites me to bet. That's for sure. Way to start that's, a card, right? Right? Yeah. Well, nobody's watching Sunfight Bass. Get hyped, Wes. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I'm kind of the same with them. I, I think Rick uh, Glenn wins this fight, but man, at minus two hundred, that, that's just that's kind of crazy, man. Um, I, I don't think this is a fight you can really touch. Um, probably boring um, goes to a decision fight, but I think Rick Glenn takes it. But there's no way I can touch his fight at, at minus two hundred. Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I think Rick Glenn probably wins. If Nova was a little bit more active. I would give him a much better shot in this fight because he's probably the better wrestler. He might be able to score a takedown or two on Glenn to steal a close round. I just don't think he's going to do enough while they're on the feet for the rounds to be all that close. So I think Glenn basically wins it on volume. Um, you know, maybe he, he gets into a little groove and kind of makes it entertaining out there, but I don't have huge expectations for this fight. Speaking of fights we don't have huge expectations for, welterweight division, it's the return of Ryan LaFleur, the uh, <laughs> MMA's resident, resident lax bro, taking on Juan Carnejo. Jay? Hmm. 
I got LaFleur B minus, Rowan Carnero C minus. Um, the, the issue with Rowan Carnero is, you know, Juan. Juan, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> um, he just, he, you know, since he's dropped, you know, he, at this weight, he's just, he doesn't look like, like he looks drained out. And that's really a problem. He's also older. Um, and I don't think he can really keep up a pace that LaFleur can. LaFleur has a pretty good motor. Um, you know, keeps pretty active on the feet and, you know, a pretty solid wrestler. Um, you know, I'd even argue he's a good wrestler. Um, in terms of MMA. Um, so I think this is a tough fight, even with, uh, LaFleur coming off, you know, a pretty lengthy layoff. Um, this is his fight to win. Um, he's also the local guy here as well. Um, you know, solid wrestler has keeps keeps volume on the feet. I think that leads to a victory, probably a decision. Um, but it's gonna. I think it's gonna be pretty hard for Carnero to get a decision um, in New York. Um, and I don't see him choking out Lafleur. So um, Lafleur wins. And lacrosse too. Farmington State represent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> does, does anybody get that reference, Brad? What? Does anybody oh. get that reference? That's where he played lacrosse. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's not a reference. It's just it's just, it's just a fact. It's a fact. It's just a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> Are you ready to have your mind hole blown with another fact, Nushan? Yep. Bring it. There's only one letter difference in Ryan and Juan. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Oh, my God. Break that's, it down. That's, that's livening up this, this fight. I think this is going to be a boring fight. I played over two and a half <laughs> at minus 200. Um, I think LaFleur is going to do enough with uh, his volume strikes, and he's got that wrestling there, and, and I just don't think uh, Carnero is going to do anything off his back. So it's going to be boring. That's what it's going to be. The over specialist. Wesley. You betcha. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page. Um I just I don't think uh Canaro can can catch LaFleur in anything. He he's got really good sub defense. He he went three rounds with, with Maya. Uh the layoff is a little worrisome, but five, like five rounds actually. Or yeah, five rounds, my bad. Um like Jay said, he uh he's hometown guy out there, man. With these judges nowadays, we see that they're still as just as bad as they've ever been and they show, you know, biased in most places, so yeah, this is just going to be an ugly. I, I kind of see LaFleur doing a little bit more wrestling in this fight and um, not worrying about Canaro off his back and just kind of grinding for three rounds. So, yeah, uh, LaFleur for me. Yeah, same page as you guys. You know, so far, Ryan LaFleur has fought 100 of a possible 100 minutes in his UFC career. And uh, I think that's going to turn into 115 of 115 possible minutes. And then he gets his hand raised at the end of it. Ryan Flair by decision. And moving up to the heavyweight division, we have Marcin Tabura taking on short notice replacement Justin Willis making his UFC debut. I'm going to pull a little Lance here. I don't have no idea who Justin Willis is. Jay? <laughs> I mean, I haven't finished my analysis yet either, um, but I can tell you a little bit about Willis that he's six foot four. He's got an 82 inch reach, which, which I think is like the third longest in the heavyweight division currently. Um, outside oh, he's of a black dude. Outside of strong. Uh-oh. Maybe one inch. He also trains at AKA, so. Hog advantage. Um, obviously, he trains at some pretty big heavyweights. So this is pretty interesting. Um, I mean, I haven't seen him, but I mean, in terms of just physical attributes, I mean, he certainly fits the bill of a guy who can potentially do well in MMA. Um, so there's that. Uh, Tibur, I think, is an underrated heavyweight. I, I grade him a C minus. Um, he came into the UFC with pretty decent fanfare out of Europe, um, but he is fairly small for the division. Um, but he is pretty technically skilled um, and has a good grappling game. So um, if Willis does win, I mean, five days five days notice is is very is really tough to come in um against a pretty skilled fighter um so uh, you know this is this seems like a pretty intriguing contest um so i'm kind of looking forward to it but like i said i haven't finished my willis analysis yet so um i can't really pick a winner here sean willis has got those seven year old saggy titties too don't, don't <laughs> so does that. curtis blades though yeah <laughs> just posted <up> <laughs> so, so this oh 
<laughs> yeah, so uh, it, you never know what you're going to get with those. It's, it's not the greatest uh, greatest um, thing to base your pick on. I mean, you like you said, Blades has got uh, some some fine ones as well. But then you got uh, the old Beaston has got some some ugly ones too. So it's a tough choice. <laughs> It's a tough, tough choice. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll pick Tibera because late late notice and yeah, I don't know enough about this Justin Willis dude. What you talking about, Willis? Wesley, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, if this guy doesn't have like fatty kind of fatty written like all over him, I mean, <laughs> these titties and belly. He's got a he's got a chain with a padlock tattooed like in between. I, I'm his. looking at that right now. That's <laughs> Wait, Wait, I'm looking it's at like, it. It's sitting in between his cleavage, like oh shit, that's a tattoo. Like, <laughs> I thought that was a ch- I thought that was a Mr. T chain for a second. <laughs> I don't get that. That kind of reminds me of, you, you know, those like weird beach shirts that look like a bikini and like chicks wear them. So it looks like they're wearing a bikini when it's just a T-shirt. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about, Jay. Yeah. Like this is like, is this like the machismo version of that? Like you just tattoo a chain on your chest. <laughs> like what? Like is, is like I don't have money for a chain, so like a really nice chain. So I'm just gonna pay for a tattoo that looks like a really nice chain. Hell yeah! Wouldn't the tattoo cost more? Probably. <laughs> Necessarily, I mean, that's you know, it's a platinum chain. You know, that's that's real money there, Brad. I don't know. I don't know what the cost of metal is in Canada. This dude is not buying himself a platinum chain. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Uh, not for not, six and six or whatever he's making for this fight. He's beating dude, that's, five eight. That's going on fucking Brooklyn area pizza joints when he's done, dude. <laughs> he better get that win bonus. Yes. Uh, yeah, top burr, top for me. But yeah, that I want to see a a fatty's gonna fatty line. Yeah, I I guess. Tybura, as I said, I, I haven't looked up Willis at all. Um, you know, I, I I sort of got an idea of what I want to bet for this card, and I don't think that whatever line comes out in this fight is going to affect that at all. So I'm probably not even going to do a, a whole lot of homework on it. So for me, just moving on to the next one. Kicking it up to Fox Sports 1, flyweight division, Ian McCall... The man of a thousand injuries taking on the spider monkey, Jared Brooks, another short notice opponent, Jay. I kind of like the nickname for a flyweight, though. Yeah. I'll say that. I think it fits. I got McCall a B- minus at this point in his career. Um, Again, I I haven't finished my research on Jared Brooks. Um, I think, though, this is really a – you know, I've said this in the past about certain fighters – um, that the fight's really a referendum on them, kind of a, like the Rousey Nunez fight. That was a referendum on Rousey, um, and she failed miserably. I think this is the case with Ian McCall. This really comes down to McCall, um, because in terms of talent at his peak, he was, uh, you know, a consistent top four guy in this weight class. Uh, there's no denying that. Um, but he's had so many injuries. He, he, he rarely fights because of other fighters pulling out and him not being able to fight. It's 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 all over the place. Um, so it's kind of a you know he's kind of in a tough place. So it's really it's really dependent on how he fights, and I'm I really don't know how that's going to be. So we'll see. Sean, yeah, who knows what's going on with with Ian McCall at this point? Uh, with just how brittle he is, and then just having fight after fight after fight canceled for one reason or another. Either he's hurt or is opponent got hurt or or whatever and now he's fighting an und like a a newcomer i don't know if he's gonna get up for this fight at all um obviously the line has come way down uh i'm not gonna bet jared brooks at this point i did put uh, a little bit of money on him and in gamble master just uh just purely on fade mccall at this point in his career so i guess i'll pick brooks to uh win a decision Wes, what do you got? Yeah, I, I got to look a, at Brooks a little bit more, but just this line, I, I wasn't going to bet this fight, but the line's just getting there for me. And I agree with everything Sean said, but th- this is like, 
do or die for McCall here. This is, are you still going to continue fighting or are you just going to start doing podcasts and shit? And, uh, <laughs> I just, I, I think McCall still wants to scrap. Um, and I, I think the fight cancellations are going to play into a positive that he's going to want to get out there and, and fight. Um, but like I said, I still got to do some more, um, looking at Brooks cause, uh, from what I've seen, he's he's pretty skilled. So um, that line, man, is just kind of crazy to me. Uh, McCall a couple years ago would be minus four five hundred to this guy. So it makes me think. But like I said, I got to look at Brooks a little more. As of right now, it's McCall, and I'm I'm trying to talk myself out of not betting. Yeah, for me, this is a it's a tricky one because you know in the, the opening odds article, I was kind of leaning towards Brooks. You know, because he's quite good, and obviously Ian McCall has all of his issues. Um, you know, who knows where he's at physically? Like, we know it's not good, but who knows how bad it is physically for him at this point? Mentally, you know, who knows where his uh, where his head's at coming in the, into this fight, having like four fights in a row cancel on him. Um, now he's had a, a pretty huge layoff since he actually stepped in the cage from the last time. So with all that, you know, with the the plus 145 that opened on Brooks, I was debating a bet, and now it's all the way down at minus 110 both ways. And, you know, I tweeted out today, I was like, McCall is minus 110. That line seems super trappy at this point, but it might just be enough to sucker me in. I'm going to hold off, um, you know, just not go against that initial instinct that I had. And I, I'm going to still pick Brooks to to win the decision here. Um, but in terms of skill, I, I still think that Ian McCall is the more skilled fighter. It's just, you know, it's impossible to trust him physically or, or mentally in this spot. Moving on to the next fight in the lightweight division, we have Nick Lentz, the Carney, taking on... This fight is basically Murica versus Islam. <laughs> if Nick, Nick Lentz loses, then Islam is allowed into America. That's wow. what it is. This, uh, this sleeper is, sales. This sleeper is, sales everywhere. This is the fight Trump. Trump is going to be at this card. You know, Alex. it's right, right down the road from some of his hotels. He's going to be at this card. He is, yeah. He's going to be cheering on Nick Lentz. With, you know, all, his, the, with all his heart. <laughs> exactly. Alex Jones is going to be caged. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Just lit up. Alex Jones is going to be, you know, <laughs> Joe Rogan is going to hand him some whiskey and some weed, and he's just going to be on fire for this fight. <laughs> he's already he's already got it written out. He is. <laughs> he, tower, ni- tower nine. Tower nine. Tower seven. <laughs> Jay, what do you got here? I got both these guys a C plus. I think this is a really interesting fight because they both do a lot of the same things. Uh, you know, I'm one. You know, you know, in my history of this show, I've I tend to usually f- go with the you know the Russian fighters. I think that they're You're generally a big fan of the Middle East. Yes, they're generally underrated. Um, but this is a tough fight for. Um, Makachev because um, he was in a fight last time with Chris Wade, who's not as good a grappler as Nick Lentz is, and it was a competitive contest. He, sh- he Makachev surely won, but it was very competitive. It's not going to be a striking matchup. It's going to be who can get the better of the grappling, and it's going to be close. Um, I could see some, you know, some potential scrambles and just Lentz's physicality. I think could win him the fight. Um, so it's really interesting to me. Um, I'd be surprised if it doesn't go to the scorecards. I mean, it just seems like a fight that will. Um, but, you know, I'm leaning towards Nick Lentz. Um, and, you know, I don't really want to, but I think this is, like, pretty much kind of like a kryptonite for a guy like Makachev, other than being KO'd on the feet by a by a stud with great takedown defense, is facing someone who's just as a, good of a grinder as he is and, and is more physical. Um, Makachev doesn't have the physicality that, um, that Nick Lentz does. And I think that's the difference. So I'm actually going to go ahead and pick Nick Lentz to get the win here. Sean. 
I played Makachev really small at the opener at, at minus 160. I didn't mind that number. And now that number has ballooned to plus 220, which is, is pretty crazy to me. Um, I do think this is a, a fairly close fight. Um, Nick Lentz has been in there with much better fighters and a lot longer. Um, and it's going to be his style of fight. It's going to be a grind. And... It could be dicey for anybody laying that juice on on Makachev, so uh, I'll definitely be picking uh, Nance, Lentz in uh, in Toutmaster when it's plus two twenty. It's crazy. And Wes, yeah, I'm. I kind of see this fight how Jay does. I think they both do kind of a lot of the same type of stuff. Um, I just think Lentz is a little bit more tricky. He's, he's just got to, you know. Um, he's been around for a while, man. He, he's been in there with, with some really good guys and, um, I just think it's going to be a really close fight and plus 220 is just, it's a little out there for Lentz against a, a guy that basically does the same thing as he does and 50 50 fight in my eyes. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely be taking the shot on, on Nick Lentz. I'll be betting him and picking him in Toutmaster for sure. Yeah, I, uh, I'm right on board with you guys. I think that this is a very close fight. Two guys that have similar styles. Um, I would say that Mac and Cheese is a little bit more dangerous with his sub game, um, but Lentz is probably a, a more controlling fighter overall. Uh, so we'll see how that all plays out. But even though I've seen Lentz start to, to decline a little bit, uh, I still think that he's got enough in the tank to win this fight. Uh, I think his experience is going to be a huge factor. Just in those little positions when they're stuck in the clinch, I think that Lentz is going to be smart enough to turn uh, mac, mac and cheese up against the the cage and control those positions a little bit more just to steal a couple extra points on the, the judges' scorecards. Uh, and I think in the end... You know, Mac and Cheese is going to storm back a little bit in the thirds because I think Lentz is going to slow down a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be enough. I expect Lentz to take a, a very close, maybe a little bit of a, a controversial decision, um, but, you know, as the other guy said, I think this is a, a very competitive fight, except you're getting plus 220 on the guy who's the, the more proven and experienced fighter, so... For me, I, I had to take that. Uh, I actually put two units on Nick Lentz at plus 220. And Nick Lentz is going to be the first of two consensus bets on this card. It's actually just going to be a half unit on Nick Lentz, also at plus 220. That is the first 5dimes.eu consensus bet of the evening. Head over there, 5dimes, for all of your MMA gambling needs. Next up, we have in the flyweight division again, Wilson Hayes taking on Yuta Alka Sasaki. Jay? Yeah, I got Hayes a B, Sasaki a D plus. I got to be honest, this is a blowout. Um, I'm trying to understand is there, if there's anyone who's playing Sasaki. I just don't, I don't really see a way to a path to victory for him. Hayes is a much, much, much better wrestler. Um, Sasaki has a decent submission game, but how is he really going to do it when Hayes is going to be sitting in top control the entire fight? Um, even from a striking standpoint, Wilson Hayes is better than Sasaki. I mean, sure, Hayes is a little short for the weight class, but he's just so dominant from top position. Um, and Sasaki's not going to be able to t- stop the takedowns. I don't see it at all. Um, and Sasaki, again, coming from Japan, those fighters usually when they fight in the U.S., um, you know, they tend to struggle. Um, that's just kind of how it is for the most part. Um, just, you know, flying overseas, fighting over here. It's just a different ball game. Um, and he's going to struggle in this bout. It's going to be one way traffic. Um, I have him in a, a three leg parlay. Um, I'll name the other two when we get to them. New Sean, do you think we're going to find out a new way to pronounce Sasaki's name on Saturday? Is it going to be like Sasaki? <laughs> Probably. Is that going to be his new name? Uh, that sounds that sounds legit. Yeah. You know, they they just they like switching it up all the time, you know, trying to confuse the uh the play-by-play guys and all that. Yeah, keep us on our toes. Yeah. So, this has got to be like a record from going to such a high-level opponent to 
the shitty, like a really shitty opponent, right? Like he was supposed to fight DJ, and now he's fighting Yuta Sasaki. Like that is fucking well, he had drastic. His last fight too. Again, <laughs> uh, what was it? Alex Kid Hector, Alex whatever Sandoval, that guy. Oh yeah, him. That was oh. after his supposed title shot too, wasn't it? I forgot about that. Uh, was it? I thought that it was like, and then he got it again after that, and then they're like, no, now you're fighting Sasaki. I don't remember, but Maybe there's. It's- it's, I will reference Tapology Will you talk. Sounds good. This is a ridiculous uh, spread in 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 overall fighting ability. Uh, I don't see any way Sasaki wins. All I can see is maybe Hayes has a letdown because he's fighting such a shit fighter compared to fighting, you know, for a title or or another high ranked opponent, but. This should be domination. I, I don't know if Hayes finishes. Most likely he does because, I mean, Sasaki has been finished multiple times in the UFC. So uh, I'm not playing the under. I know a lot of people are, and that's kind of scaring me away from it. So I will just pick Hayes. Nice. So just before we move on to Wes, he was supposed to fight Johnson, or DJ on UFC 201. Johnson got injured. Then he was supposed to fight... Sean Salmonella, and that guy didn't do his pre-fight medicals. There might have been a uh, a contagion issue there, uh, and then they replaced him with Hector Sandoval, also on UFC 201. And then obviously he beat him in like a minute fifty, and then got booked into this fight. So no rebooking of the Demetrius Johnson fight. Apparently the big win over uh, Hector Kid Alex Sandoval. Doesn't get you a title shot these days. Weird. <laughs> who, who knew? Wes, <laughs> what you got? Yeah, I'm kind of the same here. Um, I like Hayes inside the distance. Uh, if every, you know, uh, greatest capper in the world on Twitter wasn't already on the under, I would already played it fairly big, but that's kind of worrying me. So uh, as of right now, it's uh, Hayes as a pick and still kind of, I don't know, trying to talk myself into playing the under. I've watched entirely too many Wilson Hayes fights across my MMA viewing career to ever have faith in something like Wilson Hayes inside the distance. <laughs> true. Like, Very true. He, he's the type of guy that he's going to get takedowns. He's going to control you from top position. At some point during the fight, he's probably going to get hurt or put himself in a bad position. And then he's going to recover from it, get back on top, and grind out a decision. So, yeah, he'll finish guys like Scott Jorgensen, who are absolutely at the end of their career, or, or Hector Sandoval, who's completely overmatched. But Yuta Sasaki's a good grappler. I, I don't think he's going to have a problem with gassing and getting caught. And it's not like he got caught by somebody that was a shitty grappler. Uh, I, I think that Leandro Issa is probably a, a slicker BJJ player, you know, in, in terms of actual submission skill than Wilson Hayes. So I'm fully expecting Wilson Hayes to just get on top and uh, grind out a, a three round decision. And yeah, as far as Jay's question, um, you know, what's Sasaki's path to victory? The pretty much the only thing that I could see is if Hayes, takes a bad shot from outside and runs right into a knee from Sasaki because he does throw some knees out there half decent at times. So that that's about the only way I could see him picking up and win, and that is very, very unlikely in this fight. Next up, the Fox Sports 1 main event. We've got looking for a fight, Randy Brown, Randy Downtown Brown, taking on Bilal Muhammad. So we've got Islam and Muhammad on the Fox Sports 1 prelims. <laughs> You're taking over, Brad. <laughs> They've it, is, it, is Brooklyn. it is Brooklyn. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. So, Very accepting place. Jay, and um, you know, talk about this melting pot fight. Yeah, I got both these guys a C-. minus. Um, this one's interesting because um, I, I think this is going to be a mainly a striking exchange. Um and Muhammad's definitely more of a workhorse. Um, you know, it gets better as fights go on, and Brown is just really long um, and is a, is a 
deadly striker in his own right. Um, I think Muhammad has more potential to beat better fighters. Um, but I don't really think this matchup works in Muhammad's hands because Brown is so long. I think that that's a disadvantage. Um, and Brown can, um, KO Muhammad and Muhammad's coming off a pretty bad KO loss too. I believe that's the first KO loss of his career. So I think this is uh, a tough fight. Again, Brown's fighting in hometown land. We have a, a lot of that on this card. Um, so I'm leaning towards Randy Brown getting the job done, but he's also a guy that almost lost to Eric Montano um, his last time he fought. So Augusto kind of Montano. Oh, sorry, wrong. No, Montano. no, wait, wait. no he's no, right. He's out. right. Eric. <laughs> It was there the other is. one. There. Alec. <laughs> well, all Muhammad almost lost to Augusto Montano. There's a lot of Montano. and I think Montano just means in Spanish, terrible. There it is. <laughs> El, El Terrible. El Terrible. El Terrible, yes. El Terrible. Sean, what you got here? Oh, yeah. I, I kind of like Bilal Muhammad here. I, I think he's getting a little undervalued. I mean, the whole knockout thing does scare me. It was only three months ago, and, and Luke did put him down pretty damn good. But I've I've never really been impressed by Randy Brown. Like like Jay said, he was definitely losing to Eric Montano. He's lost to, to Michael Graves. And, I mean, but Bilal Muhammad's kind of a weird thing. I mean, he impressed us with getting lit up pretty well and then coming back in the third round against Joban and then he didn't do great against Montano and then got knocked out in Luque. So it's it's kind of a weird fight. I played uh, Muhammad small in, in Gamble Master. I'll probably add him. Has a small real bet as well. Um, but yeah, I just think he's just a little bit better and, and I think he's going to go farther in his career and I'm, I'm always down for fading the looking for a fighter guys. Wesley? Yeah, I'm kind of leaning uh, Sean's way here. Um, I think Muhammad's been a, a little undervalued um, just because of that knockout loss. But, I mean, we, we've we seen now that, you know, Luque's probably pretty fucking good. So um, I'm just not totally, you know, impressed with Brown. I've made some money on him in some of his fights. But I just think how Michael Graves caught him, Muhammad can get him here. I think Muhammad is is a better wrestler, and I think if he can get inside and, and not let Brown use that distance on him, that uh, he could get him down and possibly sub him here. I just think that Muhammad's the better all-around fighter. Um, if he doesn't fight smart, though, like I said, and gets inside of that reach, uh, Brown does use it fairly well, but I'm with Sean here. I think Muhammad's the better all-around fighter, and not sure if I'm going to bet it yet, but if he keeps getting plus money, I think he's even right now. Um, I might have to. For me, I, I'm going the other way from you guys on this one. I actually like Randy Brown a little bit in this fight. Bilal Muhammad's defense is just absolutely atrocious. Uh, he gets hit by pretty much everything, you know, whether it's getting almost just destroyed by Alan Juban. Um, you know, you could almost say that he was down two rounds to Augusto Montano. I know he got a takedown in the second round there, but the first round definitely went, went to Montano. Second round was super competitive, and then he sort of turned it up in the third round, and then he got knocked out by Vicente Luque in his third fight. So I'm kind of at, still at that point where I think Muhammad is overrated, and people are still overrating him from you know, getting the shit beat out of him by Alan Juban and then coming back and being able to put a little bit of damage on Juban, who was clearly gassed at that point. So unless Brown goes out there, controls this fight, and then gasses and lets Muhammad get back into it, I think that Randy Brown's going to control this this bout. Um, Muhammad's probably a little bit of a, a better wrestler, but I think that Brown's takedown defense has definitely improved since he came into the UFC. You know, and getting taken down by Michael Graves isn't such a bad thing. That guy's a, a pretty good wrestler and a pretty good grappler. Um, so I think that Brown can stop Muhammad's takedowns. I think he can sort of piece him up on the feet uh, and do it at a, a pace that he can definitely maintain. You know, maybe he doesn't dominate all three rounds because Muhammad does have really good cardio, 
but I, I definitely think that Brown's going to be able to get his hand raised here. Next up, we are moving to the main card, kicking it off in the lightweight division. We have Dustin the Diamond Poirier taking on Jim Miller. Jay, what you got here? Yeah, I got a uh, Poirier B plus, uh, uh, Miller C plus. Uh, this is gonna be tough for Jim Miller because uh, it, because Dustin's gonna come at him fully aggressive. Um, it's a dangerous fight, um, and I think I think. I mean, Jim's fought pretty decently his last couple fights. He's, um, he's, he seems to have a, a bit of a rejuvenated career, but he's facing a different beast here. A guy who hits harder, much more talented striker than some of his previous opponents. He's not facing a guy who's on that, you know, on the way out of his career. He's facing a guy who's pretty much, um, at his peak physical condition and ability. So, um, I think this is a showcase fight for Dustin, um, to get the W. Um, and I think he'll do so, um, you know, pretty quickly in this bout. Um, so I like the, I actually have a bet on the under, uh, the under two and a half, which is minus 115. I think that's a pretty good price. Um, and I took that bet and I also have Dustin in a parlay. Um, that's that three teamer I told you about with Dustin and Wilson Hayes. There's another piece later on this card. Sean. So this fight opened minus 190 for Dustin Poirier, and now he's minus 475. That's a, it's a pretty crazy, pretty big, uh, pretty it's a pretty big, big jump. <laughs> um, Poirier is coming off that knockout loss to, um, to, uh, Michael Johnson, and that's a little sketchy because, I mean, Poirier has been put down a couple times in his career. I mean, Connor got him and, and Johnson got him. It's not like Jim Miller's gonna do it to him, but, uh, it might might make this fight a little bit closer than what maybe the line shows. Just uh, maybe he's a little more hesitant to, to you know exchange and stuff like that. Um, but I've I've kind of been very down on on Jim Miller. I kind of thought he was done, but he's kind of proved me wrong. I mean, that Joe Lozon fight was I don't know that was that was a pretty close fight. I thought Joe Lozon probably should have won that. So. Um, the pick is definitely Poirier. He should win. It's just that's a pretty damn high number, considering the the stuff that's kind of happened recently. Wesley, yeah, I, I do kind of think Miller is is getting on the downside. I mean, he lost to Diego. <clears throat> he beat you know the ghost of, of Tagonori Gomi. He lost to, to Lozon. I mean, the fight was kind of close, but I think most people scored that, and then you know he beat. You know, Alves. Um, the knockout does kind of worry me. I mean, you always got to worry about a dude coming off of a of a knockout like that. But seems like he's taking the proper amount of time off, and he's you know not cutting all that weight like he was. Um, you got to like Dustin here. The line is kind of out of whack. Um, I do kind of agree with Jay though. The under, I think, it is worth a look. Um, if Miller gets him, I, I think it is just somewhere, you know, Dustin is diving in for something and, and gets caught in, in one of Miller's, you know, guillotines that we, we know he has. Um, but I think Dustin could absolutely finish Miller in this fight and, and he's probably going to in the second or third round. So, um, I might look at the under, see what Poirier inside the distance is or, or something like that fight doesn't go distance for a parlay. Uh, but my pick is going to be Poirier. Yeah, and I'm going to pick Poirier here as well. Uh, Miller has really won his recent fights by being able to get guys down and get in top position against them, and I just don't think he's going to have a whole lot of success trying to do that against Dustin. You know, Maybe if he can get uh, a body lock from the inside, it's going back, what, like five years at this point to, to when Poirier fought. Uh, Korean Zombie, but Korean Zombie was able to get some really nice takedowns from the the body lock in that fight, and you know I, I think Jim Miller's a better wrestler than Korean Zombie is, um, has a little bit more size too, but I think Poirier's improved to the point where he uses his foot foot speed a little bit better to stay out of the the grappling range unless he wants to be there, and I, I think his wrestling overall is a little bit better, so. I think he manages to stay off of his back and on the feet. You know, you can put it on Jim Miller to the point where he either shuts down, doesn't want to be there anymore, or you can actually just put him away. So 
I think that's what's going to happen here. Poirier ends up getting the victory. Uh, I think he probably stops Jim Miller in this one. Next up, we have in the light heavyweight division, Glover Teixeira taking on Jared Cannonier, who beat a dude, and now everyone thinks he's like the next thing at light heavyweight. Mm-hmm. And I don't get it. Jay, do you get it? It's, it's tough um, to get it. Um, but yeah, I got to share a B plus. Canon A is C minus. And the only thing I can think of here is that people saw Rumble just obliterate to share And now this is his first fight after that obliteration. And, you know, it just has that post like massive KO, you know, blues. And he's facing a guy that hits pretty hard in, in Canon I mean, Canon has pretty decent hands, but outside of that, there's not much else there. Um, I mean, if this fight goes to the ground, Glover has a huge advantage. Um, I think Glover has potential to even submit Kanye, assuming the fight does go to the ground. I mean, Kanye has decent takedown defense, but, I mean, Glover, Glover's got a pretty solid wrestling game. Um, and, you know, if, like I said, if he's able to take it to the ground, I mean, defensive wrestling is a question mark, but, you know, from an offensive standpoint, I mean, he can certainly do some damage. Um, and then the, the the submissions out there, um, yeah. But the line is definitely a bit short because outside of that, you know, the one win Kenya has, he hasn't shown much, um, you know, in general. So take that what you want. Um, if you're going to play Kenya, you have to play by knockout. He's not winning any other way in this fight. Sean, when this fight was announced, I was like, "What the hell are they doing here? They're gonna they're gonna match Kenya up against the top five guy after, you know, a." a competitive but good win against cute labia like come on like we're, we're going from one spectrum to the to the to the high end um glover did get flatlined by rumble but i mean that happens to pretty much everybody and uh you know he's he's kind of rested he it was five and a half months ago at this point so hopefully his his brain's you know not as scrambled as it was after uh, that punch um, and like Jay said, Glover's got a, a huge submission advantage in this fight. So if it, it hits the ground, I think Glover's gonna gonna get it done on the ground. And uh, yeah, I was like, mm, maybe I can get a big big number on Cannonier and, and just kind of look play a small play on that. But when the the line came out, it was short, and it's got even shorter now. So I uh, I played Glover at at minus one sixty five. I think that is pretty damn short. Wesley? Yeah, th- this is definitely one of those head scratching, um, fight bookings that, you know, they seem to do from time to time. Um, there, there's like levels in this sport and this is just two guys at different levels right now. I think, um, I, I don't think you can put not much of anything in, in Glover getting, you know, flatlined by, by Rumble. I mean, Rumble's, Second or third, you know, best fighter in the division, one of the best in, in, you know, the entire sport. Um, you know, you gotta, he is 32. He's getting a little older, but <clears throat> in a division that's, that's literally barren and, and needing guys to put him against, uh, Glover at this point is just kind of, kind of stupid in my opinion. But, um, yeah, if Glover had some some fresh dudes from the high school, they was busting over to let him knock out on a daily occasion up in the garage. <clears throat> I, I think he he's gonna win this fight, man. Uh, I, the line's kind of puzzling to me too. That it's a really short price on. I mean, Glover's he's thirty seven now, but he's not been in these like massive wars where he's you know taking beatings. Uh, he didn't take a beating in in the Rumble fight. Um, I mean, I just, I really don't get it here. I guess Kenny Ye could, could catch him. Um, that's still light heavyweight. They're, they're big guys, but I mean, just the technique is just on way different levels. Glover's boxing is legit. I mean, he's got some of the best boxing in the division. <clears throat> and then, like Jay said, on the mat, subs, wrestling, it, it's all, there's just levels to this shit. And uh, I think Kenny Ye's in, in deep here. Um, the line on Glover is, is awesome. I took a little when it was, uh, minus 150, um, and I'll probably put him in a in a parlay with somebody as well. Yeah, for me, uh, I really like Glover <laughs> here as well. Um, you know, I 
I thought the line opening at minus 210 was fair, you know, because there is a little bit of hype on Cannon Ye after his first uh, light heavyweight fight, and obviously Glover's coming off a, a massive KO. But now it's down to minus 165. It even got a little bit lower than that at some points. And I, I had to jump in on it. You know, maybe it's... Maybe it's a bit of a trap um, because he's older, but until I see somebody that's not an elite fighter be able to beat this guy, I just can't see it happening. And I really don't think this is a good matchup for Jared Kennanier to make it happen. Uh, this is a dude that got taken down six times by Cute Labia in his last fight. If that dude can get you down six times, Glover's a better wrestler than him. Um, Glover's going to be bigger than him. Maybe he's a little bit stronger, but I would even say Glover's probably a little bit stronger than him. So I think Glover can get you down. And once Glover gets you down, it's a completely different BJJ game that you're dealing with than than Cute Labia, who's really doesn't have much of a, a submission game at all. So I think Glover's going to be able to get takedowns here. I think eventually he's going to find a sub as well. So. <laughs> I like Glover. Uh, I'll be looking to see what that sub prop is. If it's you know plus two fifty, plus three hundred, uh, or higher, I'm going to be throwing it into a round robin. Uh, but as for now, Glover is the first leg of a parlay that I have. It's also the first leg of the second MMA analysis consensus bet of the week, and we're going to get to the next part of it right now. We're going to keep you in suspense, though, until we're finished our <laughs> breakdowns on this one. Because it's in the middleweight division. We got Jacare against the legend from Maine, Timbo. Jay? Yeah. Is, is Timbo going to beat up that gator? The gator that got Chubb's hand? Yeah, the Chubb's <laughs> hand. I got Timbo's a C plus and Jacare is an A+. Plus. Uh I don't know if anyone's ever in the history of this sport um, in terms of facing opponents um, in terms of opposite ends of the speed spectrum um, has done um, that as much as Jacare is in this fight. He went from Yuel Romero to Tim Bosch. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's going to feel like he's in the Matrix. I, yeah. I, I compare it. I'm going to compare it to say like somebody going to a batting cage at 95 miles an hour and now has to hit. 65 mile an hour pitches. That's what it feels like to me. He's going to be able to see everything. Um, it's going to be, it's such a massive speed advantage. And I mean, Jock Ray already has the advantage on the feet. He's improved his striking so much over the last few years. Um, he's able to KO opponents, um, whether it's ground and pound, even on the feet. And then obviously any sort of ground game. His offensive ground game is actually pretty sick. Um, even, even his offensive wrestling, he's the average is about three and a half takedowns per 15 minutes in the octagon. I think 45% success, so you know, pretty high numbers. And then obviously his his jujitsu is pretty much otherworldly. It's right up there um, with Maya and a couple other guys in terms of the best in in mixed martial arts today. Um, Tim Bosch is going to be in for a lot of trouble here, outside of some miraculous, some th- some sort of thunderous uppercut. I don't see him having a chance at winning this fight. Um, uh, I mean, if if if, if if Jock Ray can survive that, you know, Herculaneum bomb from um, from Yoel Romero, he can survive what Tim Bosch has. So um, Jock Ray wins. He wins by finish. I could see it being either a KO or a submission. I think either are doable in this fight. Um, but he wins, and it's that third leg of that parlay I talked about. Um, when I bet that earlier this week, it was minus 150. So Poir- Dustin Poirier, uh Wilson Hayes and Jockery. Ooh, Sean, what you got? Yeah, this should be a beatdown. Um, I don't know what they're doing with Jockery. I mean, they, they throw him Chris Camozzi. I know there was, you know, people falling out of fights and stuff like that. And then they he's got it in his contract that every three years he has to fight Chris Camozzi. All right, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a nice one next year then. Camozzi's going to come back from being cut from the UFC again on a two-fight winning streak, and we'll fight Chris Camo- fight Jacare on short notice. Yep. Camozzi, he just needs to make sure the next one's in Nashville. 
There you go. <laughs> Get those tips. Yep. Um, yeah, Bosch is, is not good. I mean, he's, he's got a couple of wins now, but before that, he was on a, a pretty bad losing streak, losing to some not great fighters. Um, I think Jacare can, can take this kind of any way he wants. Um, Jay was talking before the, the podcast about looking maybe at fight doesn't start round three. Uh, Bosch hasn't been in the third round since 2013, which yep. is like one, two, three, like eight fights or something like that. Like, I think it's eight straight fights. Yeah. yeah. So Jacare might take his time a bit, but I think he gets that finish. So might look at putting that in a parlay, but definitely, uh, I'm playing Jacare and putting him with Glover. It's it should be a a beat down. Wesley, what you got? Yeah, th- this fight goes as long as Chakare decides it goes. Pretty much, um, I've seen a couple people say, you know, maybe Tim Boach has that, you know, proverbial puncher's chance. Um, Chakare's Chakare's been knocked out twice in his career. His very first fight and that freak up kick from Musasi in Japan. So. He's not getting knocked out. He's got a granite chin. The dude doesn't get knocked out anymore. Um, Boach is, Boach doesn't have the speed to catch Jacare with anything that's going to threaten to knock him out. So this, this fight goes as long as Jacare wants it to go. Um, I, I like, kind of like the under. I like that fight doesn't start round three. Uh, Jacare inside the distance, just any way you can really play it. Um, uh, this is one of the widest fights on the entire card to me. So, yeah, Chakare all day. Yeah, obviously I like Chakare as well. Um, I've seen a l- couple people floating around the idea of betting Chakare by sub. I would stay away from that in this one because, you know, going back to what Jay mentioned, the huge speed difference, I could see Chakare landing on the feet and getting to Boach before this fight even has a chance to hit the ground. And he's one of those guys that he's evolved his game enough that when he hurts somebody, he doesn't immediately go into mm-hmm. grappling mode and look for the sub. He'll just keep hitting you until the the ref decides to step in and, and stop it. So I could definitely see Jacques Array winning by TKO um, if that's a, a big number because people are assuming there's going to be a sub. You know, maybe that's something to to go in that prop round robin, but. Just a a little bit of a, a word of caution for people that think they're just going to be able to to easily bet Jacare by sub. You know, it could come at, it could happen that he goes out there, gets a takedown, and, and works for the sub right off the bat. Uh, I can just see a, a very real possibility that that doesn't happen uh, because he's comfortable on the feet in this matchup. So I like Jacare. He is the second leg of the parlay that I have with Glover. And he's also the second leg of the five dimes dot EU consensus bets that we've got with Glover. Uh, both those I think are still available at minus 108 if you throw them together. And as we said, head over to five dimes dot EU for all of your MMA gambling needs. That's going to take us up to the co-main event, sticking in the middleweight division. We have the second Anderson Silva on this card, (laughs) potentially the real Anderson Silva, against Derek Brunson. Jay, Brunson's going to run forward with his chin up and his hands down, or is he actually going to be somewhat smart this fight? Yeah, that's the age-old question, um, because... Well, I guess I'll give my grades first. I got both these guys to be at this point. I think um, I think the issue, Brad, is that either of those scenarios seem plausible. I, I mean, Brunson could certainly run in, and Anderson is probably the best counter striker in the history of the sport, and he TKOs you coming in. Or Anderson gets taken down kind of like the Cormier fight and then is down on the ground for the majority of the bout. Um and loses that way, but again, he'll have three chances to KO him every single round. So, any, I mean, I could see him KO him in any round, you know, coming off that. So, I think it's a tough fight to call um, because both scenarios, I think, are fairly close. You know, I think either happens at a relatively, you know, you know, a fifty percent chance for for both. So, um, it's hard to pick a winner. Um, I'm gonna, for old time's sake, I'm gonna go with Anderson because. Uh, personally, I sadly I trust Anderson more than I do Derek Brunson. 
Sean? I'm picking Brunson by decision. I just think he's going to learn from that last fight. I mean, I know his striking defense is, is pretty terrible. I mean, we, we saw it the last fight. We've saw it, seen it in, in money fights before that, but Anderson's takedown defense is just so gone. And, and I've just been fading Anderson for so long. I just think he is, is, is beyond done. Um, as we saw in, in the Cormier fight, he, he does, on the ground, he can still kind of hold his own just by not getting too much damage taken. Um, it is a risk for Brunson. If he's too tentative, he might, he might get, just give Anderson too much space and get tagged and, and done and dropped. But I mean, it took, it took Whitaker quite a bit to, to finally put Brunson out, even though he was just widely, wildly running at him. So, I mean, he, he might take one from Anderson, maybe a couple, and, and hopefully he can just take take Anderson down and, and ground him out. And that's kind of what I expect to happen. Hopefully the decision number is high, and I'll play it. New Sean cheering for a boring fight again. Wes, How you dare got? I? How dare I? Yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards, towards Sean's thinking uh, right now. Um if Brunson does what he did last time, Anderson's going to get a, a highlight reel, which I hope that happens. I, I really, really do. Um, I just think after after that last fight, Brunson's got to be a little bit smarter here. I mean, th- that's a double-edged sword as well. The, I mean, the longer he leaves Anderson in the fight, the the longer he ha- you know has to get his timing down and everything. But if he just uses what he's the the really glaring advantage he's got here in that wrestling and I'm one that I never thought Anderson Silva's takedown just that part of his game was ever like really good he was just good at keeping distance and and getting guys off of him with with punches and strikes um I mean his pride days was just the dude was on his back a lot uh it got better of course but I don't think it was something that was ever like at, on par with the other parts of, of Anderson's game. But um, at this point, I don't think he can stop the takedowns from Brunson. Brunson's got really good wrestling. If if Brunson does that for, for three rounds, um, he can win this fight. So as of right now, I'm going to pick Brunson. Um, I, I don't think I can bet it. Um, if it gets down to even money, I might take a little shot on Brunson. But um, I'm just I, – I still got a little worry that the dude – Runs across the ring again and gets knocked out, but yeah, Bronson right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to lean a little bit towards Anderson in this fight, um, which is interesting considering I've never really been a, a huge Anderson fan, um, and I think that he's completely washed up. Uh, I just think that you know, judging from his last couple fights, he. He's not as washed up as I thought. Obviously, the the chin is starting to go, which is a, a big problem. But in little bursts, this guy is still as dangerous as anybody in the world. And against Brunson, who doesn't have a great chin himself, he only needs one or two of those little bursts to, to find something. So if Brunson's coming inside on him and, and getting in the clinch and trying to grind on him, I don't think he's going to put Anderson away from doing that. You know, Daniel Cormier is much better at implementing that sort of game plan than Derek Brunson is. And even Anderson was able to, to hurt Cormier with a body kick towards the end of that fight. Uh, and that was, you know, on six hours notice, you know, he, he got up off the couch and stepped into the cage uh, and looking like, you know, he had those Justin Willis tits uh, in that fight. <laughs> So if he's actually been training a little bit and Brunson doesn't come out and isn't able to to land something early on that puts Anderson away, I could see Anderson catching him at the start of round two as he comes in or if Brunson's a little bit more patient and and trying to find the perfect opening to come in, I could see Anderson landing stuff from him on the outsides. Um, So I'm going to pick Anderson, I guess, sort of a, a... yeah, you know, I don't even want to call it a nostalgia pick, just because I can see the legitimate case for him winning this fight. Um, not going to bet it or anything like that. 
Uh, I'll see what the the TKO prop is, but just the the pick of Anderson for now. Moving up to the uh, the main event, <laughs> 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 women's featherweight division, women's like co bantamweight division. Yeah, women's co bantamweight division championship match. I did the air quotes. You couldn't see it because <laughs> it's a podcast. Holly Holm, Jermaine Durandelman. <laughs> Jermaine? <laughs> yep. Jermaine to Kevin Randleman? Jerome Jermaine to Randleman. Yep. Um, yeah, Jay, take it away. I don't have grades on them because this division doesn't exist, so how do you grade somebody in a division that doesn't exist? Nothing to compare them to, so... Um, They're bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think this is going to be kind of similar to the Shevchenko fight where, I mean, Holly Holm is a boxer and she's facing a multi-dimensional striker. Um, in a boxing match, Holly Holm would win, but in a MMA fight where there's multiple t- types of striking, I think the random has an advantage. So um, while I think Holly Holm's a more well-rounded fighter, she has other, you know, she's a better grappler for sure and better off her back, <clears throat> but maybe... You know, she's still not great off her back compared to, you know, other fighters. It's, it's, I think this is going to be a striking matchup, and I think Duranda May has the advantage there, and I think that's, I think she'll ultimately win. I, I was surprised to see Duranda May a favorite because I thought there'd be a lot of hype for home. I still see a lot of people talking about Holly Holm, and that, I, you know, it's kind of like one of those situations where everyone talks about one side. There's usually the other side wins, so, um, I'm not betting it, but, I think this is a striking fight, and Durant May wins a striking fight. Sean? Yeah, before the lines were released for this fight, I was kind of hoping that Durant May would be like a mid one, plus 100 dog, and, and I'd probably play her at that point when it came out, and then it was close, and then now everybody's betting Durant May. It's, it's pushing me off from, from not betting it at all. I've, uh, I've never really been impressed by a Holly Holm. I mean, she used she went to a split with Pennington. That was a pretty uneventful fight. Same with the gym teacher. And then she struck gold against Ronda Rousey. Um, she looked okay against Tate, but then she choked in the end and then got pretty lit up by Shevchenko. Um, it's not like Duranime's done anything too special. I mean, she's she's beat not very good fighters, and, and she she's lost to some good fighters. So Come on, give... Anna Elmo's credit. <laughs> St. Elmo's fire, man. What about Larissa Pacheco? That was a good one, too. Um, Has she beaten anybody that's still in the UFC? Uh, no. The I've answer is no. no. She beat Julie Kedzie and Pacheco and Elmos. Awesome. I, don't know, I don't know if Elmos is still in in the UFC. But well, if she is, she's down at straw weight. So. Yeah. Doesn't really count. So yeah, um, definitely not betting this. Not playing the over. Just not giving a fuck about this fight. And I will pick Durand me. Wes. Yeah, it's hard to have any kind of conviction on a pick on, in this fight uh, for me. I just, I, I really don't know. Um, I think Holly is a little bit more well well rounded, but um, it. it she just likes to stand. I mean, if she stays at distance and just throws those one, two strikes at a time like she does in so many fights, I mean, I could see her getting, you know, picked apart, kind of like the Shevchenko fight. Um, I don't think, I don't think Durant May has that speed and, and combinations and stuff as, she, as Shevchenko did. So I don't know. I'm just kind of really split on this fight. Um, kind of, you know, it doesn't, it's not even an exciting fight or anything. I don't think many people's looking forward to. So I don't know. I, I guess my pick's going to be home here. Um, uh, just maybe she tries to wrestle a little bit. And I just think it, if it gets to the ground, she's just a little bit better than Durand May there. But who knows, man? I mean, maybe Holly does outstrike her. I don't like, like Sean said. I mean, who is Durand May really beaten? Uh, at least Holly's been in there with, you know, it's not much, but it's the more top of the division. So, but who really knows, man? Pick is is Holly. I can't put any money on this fight whatsoever. 
Yeah, I uh, don't care about this fight. Like it, I, I don't get it. I don't understand how this is headlining pay per view. I don't understand why they made this division. Like none of this makes sense to me. It's not a great fight. Yeah, it's supposed to be two strikers going up against each other, engaging in some sort of striking battle that should be exciting. But unless Deronome just goes out there and obliterates Holly Holm, that's the only way I can see this fight being exciting. It's going to turn into a gonna... fucking sparring contest. Yeah, what it's they'll be. both be at distance. They'll both be at distance, throw one a striker two at a time. That's what it's yep. going to be. Or Holly Holm's going to actually come in with the game plan that she should come in with and wrestle the girl that you know is just a Muay Thai striker and has never shown any wrestling ability. So I don't see a whole lot of ways that this is going to play out and be an exciting fight. I guess I, I lean a little bit towards home because she's got more ways to win the fight. But I I don't know. I might even you know click off the illegal. I mean um, the pay per view before <laughs> this fight starts because um, who cares? Who cares? That great way to end what the, a somber uh, the ending holy <laughs> shit yeah i mean we kind of expected this though so yeah yeah you know, the the worst part of it is anderson silva coming back at 47 years old and fighting you know a legitimate top 10 welterweight isn't even the close to the saddest thing on the card <laughs> They they could have probably doubled the buys of this if they would have just moved them to the main event and and promoted it with Anderson Silva. Like they could have probably doubled the buys. Yeah. Like I don't even know how many people even realize that Anderson Silva's on this card. Like Maybe honestly, probably do something about that. <laughs> nah. Nah. Nope. Uh, we're gonna make up a fake weight class with a fake belt and have only two people in the weight class, and that's gonna be the main event. Yeah. Yeah. We're either way, we're only two cards away from the return of Bibib and he's going to get his first title, so I'm okay. Who cares about that? We got Fedor next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And get depressed um, again. Against Meaty Mitts Matreon. He's going to sub Matreon, isn't he? Nah. Mm, nah. No. Matreon's going to knock uh, him out. Are we going to have this bullshit again where Matreon's going to look awesome on the feet and then all of a sudden he's going to get t- he's going to get subbed out of nowhere? Oh, it could definitely be a meathead moment. Dude, if, Fader. If meathead drops him and doesn't immediately put him out, then he's probably getting subbed. He's Fedor. gonna follow Fedor to the ground and get armbarred. Fedor uh-huh. gets uh, Maldonado, man. Just it changes every thinking that I have about Fedor as far as fighting yep. anybody now. Maldonado was like on top of him and shit at times in that fight. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, don't but get it. Don't get it. We'll probably have a. Uh, you know, we might do a podcast preview show for that next week or maybe we'll uh we'll bust out one of the fight companions for the bellator card next week um either way you know is that the same day as the ufc card oh the ufc card's on a sunday right oh yeah yeah sure (laughs) (laughs) you guys know i don't look ahead at stuff yeah you're right jay i just realized Um, this now too (laughs) Yeah, so we'll see um, how we're going to break things down next week. But we will be back next week in some capacity with some uh, Fedor and, and Meaty Mitz talk. So that'll at least be something to laugh about and something depressing in an amusing way. So until then, enjoy UFC 208, and we'll get back at you next week. <laughs>